State University of Iowa presents an address by the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, at the dedication of the new Iowa Law Center, April 7, 1962. The Chief Justice spoke at the Iowa Memorial Union and was introduced by Dean Mason Ladd of the College of Law. President Hanker, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to introduce a great jurist and a great statesman and an outstanding American citizen. I present to you the Honorable Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, Mr. Chief Justice. Chief Justice Garfield, members of the faculty, students, and friends of the University of Iowa. Now, when I arrived in Iowa yesterday, I saw a sign. I understand there are a lot of them around Iowa. <laughs> it said, there is no California. <laughs> I want to bring you a word of assurance <laughs> because I know you are all concerned about your your friends, your loved ones, and your neighbors who are out, <laughs> out there in greater numbers than you have any idea of. <laughs> I know because I came from California yesterday <laughs> and I saw literally millions of Iowans and their descendants. They all send their love and affection to you. <laughs> you know, I happen to have been governor of California at a time when I think your first governor while I was in that position was Bob Blue. The next was Burke Hickenlooper, and the third was the late Bill Beardsley. And every year, <coughs> they would be invited out to California to make a speech in Long Beach. And I, <coughs> I always offered to wager them that if they came, I could get them a bigger crowd of Iowans than they could get in any place in Iowa under any circumstances. <laughs> they often came, but they didn't take the bet. And they were very wise, because really, I believe, there are more Iowans, and you note, I say, and descendants of Iowans in California than there are here. And uh, I made some contribution to that myself, because if we ever get into a vote of that kind, I'll cast 19 votes. <laughs> With six children and 12 grandchildren. You know, there are parts in California where <coughs> it uh, means nothing to say you were born there, but if you say you were born in Iowa, you don't have to argue much more with people. I tried that out and was successful. The first time I campaigned in California it was down in Los Angeles, and I kept telling them I was born in Los Angeles, and nothing happened at all. But when I told them that my father came from Eagle Grove, Iowa, uh, roof came off the house. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I <coughs> I'm very happy to participate in the dedication of this uh, newest law building, at the oldest law school west of the Mississippi River. And I bring you the greetings of the members of the Supreme Court of the United States. We have an added interest in this law school 
since the court is indebted to it for one of its recent associate justices, the late Mr. Justice Rutledge, who was your dean from 1935 to 39. He came to our court by way of the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and served on the Supreme Court until his unfortunate death in 1949. He was a thorough scholar, an inspiring teacher, and a great judge. I am particularly interested <clears throat> in the dedication of this building in your law center because of the kind of activity it will house. It will contain more than fine classrooms, professors' offices, and a law library for students. It will be, I hope, in all senses, a true law center, a legal workshop where constructive contributions to the substance and administration of our jurisprudence can be initiated and developed. As society changes, new areas of law are opened up, and there is need for more than ordinary law school instruction. The teacher and his students must concentrate on the fundamentals of the profession, logical reasoning, legal method, and ethical standards. They are too busy studying adjudicated cases to devote any material portion of their efforts to a determination of the course that the law should take in the future. When this nation was founded, and that was less than a century before your own law school was established, there were only about 5,000 written opinions for courts to concern themselves with. Now, there are in the neighborhood of 3 million. In addition, there are hundreds of thousands of administrative decisions by the various state and federal agencies, which in themselves make up a sizable body of law, statute multiplied by the thousands. Thus, the emphasis in the schools must be with what the law is, and too little time can be spent on what the law should be. A law center, on the other hand, not only enriches the law school's conventional curriculum with a spirit of scholarly achievement, and the spirit of the organized bar, but it is a workshop where scholars, practitioners, and judges can be assembled, where seminars can be held, research directed, and serious consideration given to the future of the law. In the absence of such direction, the law must and usually does develop haphazardly as a result of competition between private parties who, on the basis of self-interest, are pressing for a particular result either in the legislature or in the courts. The law should keep pace with the needs of society, and the legal profession should not participate in the changes simply as a paid servant of special interest. Lawyers should interest themselves in such developments as a part of their professional obligation to the public as a whole. Unfortunately, when lawyers leave the law schools, the vast majority of them become engrossed in the problems of their clients and have little time for broader interests. The continuing education programs administered by the bar associations fine as they are, more often than not, are oriented toward instructing the bar on how to do it in order to increase their technical competence. In fact, specialization <coughs> is becoming the order of the day. And in some segments of the bar, we are developing specialties within specialties. There is great danger that in doing so, the profession will become myopic. This is particularly true in the large cities where the large law firms include a hundred or more lawyers. 
One of the dangers to the profession is that these large law firms, important as they are in the life of their communities, proselyte among the law schools of the country as avidly as the promoters of professional football do among college athletes. It seems to me that this poses a real problem for the law schools of America, since it may well be in the best interest, may well not be in the best interest of the country, for the very best students with the finest minds to be recruited for early specialization away from home and a resulting loss of interest in the profession uh, generally. I wonder whether this does not tend in a way toward mass production and a diminution of professional spirit. Should not these fine minds be distributed around the country, many of them returning to the environment of their youth, where they know the problems of their communities and have an interest in the humane problems of the law. If the test of the standing of a law school becomes the number of its graduates who are drafted by the largest law firms of the country, there is a danger that the scholastic curricula themselves will become shaped toward attaining that very end. And as Dean Lockhart was talking to you, I couldn't help thinking what a problem is created for law schools such as your own. If, if some of the law schools of the country uh, proselytize and, and take off the very best students uh, before they get to your law school, and the big law firms of the country siphon off the best after, after you've trained what you have, you really have a problem. In the Supreme Court, we justices see some of the best products of the law schools as our law clerks. These men are splendidly trained and have a real understanding of the basic principles of our jurisprudence. While they are very helpful to us, and would be even more so if we kept them year after year, we deliberately keep them only one or two years at most because we want them to take their places in the general legal profession. Some of them go to the large metropolitan firms, the big cities, but fortunately many others become teachers or enter government service in an important way or what is probably more important, return to their home communities. Incidentally, speaking of law clerks, the President of the United States just announced his nomination as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Byron R. White of Denver, Colorado, a former law clerk of my predecessor, Chief Justice Vinson, only 15 years ago. I am sure he will be a valuable addition to our court. I am interested in this law center and in the law centers of other universities because I believe they can carry on the kind of activity which will broaden the minds of lawyers and negate the accusation of Edmund Burke to the effect that the study of law sharpens the mind but does not open and liberate it and to the observation of Samuel T. Coleridge that, and I quote his words, legal studies sharpen indeed, but like a grinding stone, narrow whilst they sharpen. One great task for this and other law centers in the country is to aid in the improvement of judicial administration. This is a tremendously important task today, and a task that cannot be adequately performed by the courts alone, by the bar alone, or by the legislatures alone. It is a task that requires imagination, study, and the cooperation of all. It is just the type of endeavor for which a law center such as the Iowa Law Center can provide a catalyst. 
The necessity of improvement in our judicial administration in the United States cannot be denied. The increase in the quantity and complexity of litigation in both state and federal courts is clear for all to see. The federal district courts in 1961 terminated more than 55,000 civil cases, but the number of pending cases on January 1, 1962 exceeded 80,000 cases. The courts of appeals disposed of 4,000 cases in the same year, but there were at the end pending 2,900 cases on their dockets. Now these figures are just for the federal courts. And I might say to you that the judges of the federal courts are disposing of many more cases at present than in, than in any time in the past. But the volume, the sheer volume of cases filed causes these great backlogs to grow. The increase in complexity of the cases in the courts is equally marked. For one reason or another, the DuPont antitrust litigation took 13 years from the time the complaint was filed until the district court issued a final decree a few weeks ago. And this litigation produced a record which would fill an ordinary bookcase. The recent conviction in Philadelphia of a group of manufacturers of elect electrical equipment for price fixing has led to the filing of over 1,500 treble damage suits in a great number of district courts throughout the country. And those courts are, those cases are long protracted cases. The problem of coordinating this litigation, avoiding conflicts and making the same evidence available in the various uh, trial courts, and saving time and expense through eliminating unnecessary duplication is an example of one of the most difficult problems of judicial administration. Antitrust litigation is not the only time-consuming trial work of the courts. The man hours spent on disputes involving interstate water resources, tax litigation, patent infringement, and the rulings of the various federal administrative agencies are beyond anything conceived of at the time this law school was established. The trial of the protracted lawsuit has become one of the major problems of the federal judiciary. Now, I have less knowledge, of course, of the corresponding problems in the state courts, but we all know that they are there. I am reliably informed that in one of our neighboring states, one of your neighboring, one of your neighboring states, it takes between five and six years for a civil case to be reached for trial. There are other states where the interval is four years. This is to be contrasted with a period of six months, which according to the best judgment of the Judicial Conference of the United States, is an appropriate period of time to allow for preparation for trial. The situation is getting worse rather than better, and very little is being done to help it. The most discouraging thing is that about half of the states do not even know what their situation is. They have no judicial councils, they have no administrative offices, and they keep no adequate statistics. Only a few have seen the wisdom of vesting their chief justices or judicial councils with sufficient administrative responsibility to ensure a unified administration and to promote efficient operation of their court systems. No real progress can be made where such conditions prevail, but a real law center in a state could do much to change those conditions. I do not have to point out to you that these delays in justice have very serious consequences in the actual dispensing of justice. To postpone a decision for five or six years 
is often the same as denying a decision entirely. A person of moderate means who has suffered personal injury and cannot work is in fact compelled to settle on the best terms offered rather than submit his claim for adjudication. Businesses are affected and property is made unproductive while lawsuits drag through their, drag their weary way through our courts. Who can doubt also that there are many attorneys representing private parties who being well aware of the negotiating advantage given them through delay, purposely capitalize on this defect in our judicial system in order to reduce the liability of their clients. This could be changed. Truly, justice delayed is frequently justice denied. The easy answer to this problem would appear to be the appointment of new judges. I certainly agree that we have needed new judges in the federal service, and I'm sure in the state uh, services. And uh, we have urged on Congress on more than one occasion that the new jobs be created. As you know, new legislation has, in fact, uh, been passed providing for 63 new district judges and 10 new circuit judges in the federal system this last year. And that will increase our, our bench by about 20% in manpower. But this is not the ultimate answer to the, the problem. Because the facts of political life are that Congress and the legislatures will always lag behind the need. They have to be shown what the need is, and usually before they can be shown, the situation is very bad in, indeed, and it is too late to help a great many people. The problem of eliminating undue delays in reaching cases on the docket is not insoluble, though. Some years ago, we discovered that in one federal district, uh, the calendar was lagging four years behind. Through a program of assigning additional judges to that district, securing the cooperation of the federal government and other litigants, and by using the pretrial procedure effectively, the calendar was soon brought within manageable control. Partially as a result of that particular experience, the Judicial Conference in its fall session last year declared it the policy of the federal judiciary that every pending case three years or more should be regarded as a judicial emergency by all the judges in the circuit involved. The conferences requested each circuit to make appropriate plans for uh, mustering all available judges in that circuit to pre-try and eliminate those cases from the docket. That policy has been being carried out now, and I'm very hopeful that it, it uh, will be extremely helpful. To aid in this program of improving judicial administration is truly an appropriate function for a law center such as this. Individual judges and individual practitioners are so much preoccupied with their day-to-day -day tasks that they have little time for the overall picture. Judicial conferences and judicial councils are of great aid in the federal system, but they cannot do it alone. The law centers are admirably suited to explore every avenue that gives promise of improving the method of handling cases, to initiate the creation of new tools, or to sharpen old ones so that the courts may perform more efficiently. Scholars, practitioners, legislatures, and courts can meet in an appropriate, non-political atmosphere to seek solution to the problem. Perhaps because of my own work with the Judicial Conference, I am particularly sensitive to the need for improvement in judicial administration, but I do not mean to suggest that it is the only field appropriate for the attention of law centers. They may also concern themselves with such problems, professional ethics, improvements in procedure, 
recommendations for the codification of, of uh, legislation, and even in the, in the forming of substantive uh, law. The great field for endeavor is more appropriate provision for the protection of ind indigent litigants. You know, in many states of this union, a man who is without funds, without being able to employ a, a lawyer to defend him, must go without representation because the, the courts of, of those particular states will not supply him with, uh, uh, with a lawyer. And uh, insofar as that is concerned, we are, are far behind some of the other, uh, other countries of the world, notably the United Kingdom. We cannot claim that there is real justice in this country while there remains a difference in the kind of justice that is administered uh, to the rich and the poor. It is because I foresee that this law center will make its contribution in this field of public endeavor that I am particularly pleased to take part in its dedication. You have proved yourselves in your function as a law school, as a training place for lawyers. We know what to expect from you there because we have seen what you have done in the past. Now the challenge is to put this law center to work on the equally important task of determining not entirely what the law is, but where it is going. Our entire system of government is on trial, not only at home, but everywhere. We must convince the world, which has its eyes continually on us, that under free institutions which grow and develop without compulsion, there can be efficiency and dispatch in the handling of all our far-flung controversies involving human affairs. To do this is primarily the responsibility of the legal profession. Therefore, I urge that we make the improvement of the administration of justice its great central purpose. I am sure that in this important undertaking, the new law center of the University of Iowa will play a noble part. May we dedicate it to that purpose. Thank <laughs> you.